Good morning. It's great to be here with all of you today. Grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus Christ. It's great to be here gathered together back on a Sunday. I know last weekend was kind of a, a weird weekend and uh, with all of that eclipse madness. And I was going to say, I, I appreciate all of you uh, adjusting and meeting with us on that Friday evening. And it turned out we didn't get those crowds that we were supposed to have gotten. And so we, we kind of probably could have just uh, done things the way we normally did, uh, or do rather. And so I apologize for that. Uh, you know, made the best call I could on the information I had, and it didn't turn out the way I thought it would. But I appreciate you all pivoting and, and doing church with us last Friday, or the Friday before last, anyway. Um, as we get going, I've got a couple of announcements. Uh, actually, I was going to invite Kathy to make an announcement about our baby bottle campaign. So, Kathy, go ahead. And as a bonus, the, uh, the organization that we're, we're working with there, uh, we're going to have a couple representatives from them come and visit us on April 28th and talk for a few minutes about what they do, and they'll have some information out in the lobby, so there'll be a chance to learn a little bit more about uh, Clarity, that organization, and that's on April 28th. Uh, another thing I wanted to uh, bring to your attention, you may have noticed that we've uh, changed a little bit of the way we are displaying some things out in our lobby. We have a new banner uh, talking about or, or give it, providing information about our ministry partners. And also that, that countertop and that back wall of the lobby there, um, I'm going to try my best to keep sort of up-to-date information out there. Like, for instance, right now there's some information about uh, a concert that's coming up to benefit Churches in Mission as well as a golf scramble that Churches in Mission is holding in May. And so that's a great... Uh, that, that that back wall there is a great resource for, for recent information about, about organizations that we partner with, and we'll try to keep those up to date. Um, so keep that in mind and check out the information about that, that concert and that golf scramble that's coming up. Uh, and then other than that, uh, April 16th, uh, you will see that in your bulletin. Ladies Circle will be meeting that evening, so ladies, mark your calendars for that. Uh, otherwise, I believe that's all I have as far as announcements go, unless there was something else I should have included there no great all right let's worship together there we go that'll help good morning the, the theme to our songs this morning um, sort of worked itself out to be um, how there is no one like our God and so that theme runs through through our songs and um, even through the offertory today as it worked out. And there are a lot of verses in, in the Old Testament about it. Like in Jeremiah 10, 6, it says, No one is like you, Lord. You are great, and your name is mighty in power. And, um, and then I wanted to read one that is just sort of a uh, favorite, of, or lately it just sp kind of spoke to me from Psalm 73. Verse 23, it says, Yet I still belong to you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, leading me to a glorious destiny. Whom have I in heaven but you? I desire you more than anything on earth. My health may fail and my spirit may grow weak, but God remains the strength of my heart. He is mine forever. So um, let's praise him for his, his uniqueness, and there's no one like him this morning. Uh, so we're going to start with him 422, um, and we, we will have full words on the screen. If you choose to use the hymnal, just know that we are skipping verse 2, but that will already be reflected if you're just reading the slides. So if you um, could stand with us, if you're able and would like to, and if you need to sit, that's fine too. But we will um, join and, and bring praise to God this morning for all he, he, all he is for us. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus, no, not Hear all our souls' diseases. No, not one. 
Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the holy Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. There's not an hour that he is not near us. No, not one. No, not one. No nights are dark, but his love can cheer us. No, not one. No, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will die till the day is done. There's not a friend like the holy Jesus. No, not one, no, not one. Did ever say, find his friend, forsake him? No, not one, no, not one. Or sin to find that he would not take him? No, not one, no, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. Sing for joy. 
whose love endures through generations. I know that you will keep your covenant. I'm calling on the God of Moses, the one who opened up the ocean. you now to do the same thing for me. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Oh rock, oh rock of ages, I'm standing
the same God. You are the same Holy Spirit, come and fill us again as we stand on your faithfulness. Please quiet our hearts and our minds for Pastor John's words. Use this offering to build your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Will the ushers please gather for morning offering? The song I'm going to um, do, it's just a, a short, short, simple, but meaningful song, is one um, that we um, used to sing as a congregation, but it's been years, and um, I didn't have access to those slides, or I would have sh shown them. Um, but if you remember it or, or know it from another place, feel free to join in and sing. It's, it's just a simple one. It's called, There is None Like You.
All right, once again, let me tell you, it's great to be here with you this morning on this third Sunday in Easter. I've, I try to always point that out every year that Easter is supposed to be a two-month-long celebration. It's not just one Sunday, and of course, I believe that if we are truly the church, then we should live every day as if it's Easter, right, as, as Easter people, as people of the resurrection. And so let us go before the Lord and pray today and lift up the needs of the church and the world. God of Easter, we give thanks to you that you came into the world with a message of hope and reconciliation, that you, uh, you demonstrated for us that uh, hope is truth when you rose Jesus from the grave. And you made your appearance before your disciples and told them to go into the world and feed your sheep. And so, Lord, we're grateful that um, we, so many years later, are still the ones that you uh, call out to live as resurrection people, to live as Easter people, to be the people who uh, share that message of hope and reconciliation with the world and who who feed your sheep, Lord. And so um, today we want to come before you and just renew our love for you and our uh, dedication to that message, that good news, that gospel of Jesus Christ, that proclamation that the kingdom of God is within our grasp, that um, there is hope and reconciliation even in a broken world. Lord, we just uh, want to lift up the needs of the church and there are uh, a few that are weighing on me today, and so I'm sure they're weighing on um, many of us sitting in these pews. Um, I, I, I want to pray to you today uh, for um, Daylin and Annette's sister-in-law, who uh, just received this, this terminal diagnosis. And, um, of course, that's heartbreaking news. Um, but, again, we know, Lord, that you are uh, a God who... Um, can provide peace even in the the darkest of times and so we just pray lord that your presence would be one of um of peace and comfort to to jana and to her family at this time lord and um, the scripture tells us the apostle writes that there are times when we don't know how to pray as we ought to um, but that your spirit intercedes on our behalf um, with um, sighs that are just too deep for words. And so um, we just trust, Lord, that you know our hearts and, um, that, and that we trust you. Lord, and we think of uh, several of our friends who have uh, medical procedures coming up this week. So for, for Bob and for, for Jerry, we just pray that those um, procedures would go well. Um, that the outcome of them would be would be in their favor, that they would be able to recover quickly and, and heal well. And so we just pray for healing there, Lord. Um, and then we also just continue to uh, lift up uh, our, our, uh, our dear sister in Christ, Sue, and, and all of Don Bryson's family. And certainly we kind of count ourselves uh, uh, among that family. We do count ourselves among that family. And so um, just pray for us as we continue to just... Uh, grieve that loss, um, but even uh, to look to you and to worship you, knowing that you are the God of Easter, Lord. And so we just pray that you would continue to empower your church by the power of your Holy Spirit. Remind us of the graces that you give us daily. Remind us of your loving and merciful nature. And Lord, teach us how to be loving and merciful. In Jesus' name, amen. Sure. Mm. 
Yeah. Yeah. Amen. God is bigger than than we can even imagine. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. That's one of my favorite things to pray. Thank you, God, that you are God and I am not. Because I don't think my shoulders are strong enough to to bear that burden. Well, our scripture today is Luke chapter 17, verses 11 through 19. Um, So if you would like to follow along with your Bibles or your devices or whatever you might have, those of you following along at home on YouTube Live, you can uh, turn over in your scripture as well. Uh, We'll go to that in just a couple of minutes, but first I want to just tell a short story. Now, this probably will not go down in the list of greatest hits of sermon illustrations that I've offered, but I think it might be a relatable story. So uh, uh, shortly after Gretchen and I were married, uh, we bought a house in Lawrence on the northeast side of Indianapolis. Um, We don't own it anymore. We sold it shortly after we took the appointment here. But anyway, um, when we bought that house in Lawrence, we didn't didn't have children yet or um, anything like that. So we bought a house that was a little bit bigger than what we needed, thinking that when we did start a family, we would be glad that we had the extra space. And that house had what I think they call an upstairs great room, or a, like a loft. It had a big room uh, in, the, in the upstairs right when you went up the, the stairs that didn't have any, any real specific purpose. But it was like the biggest room in the house. And we really didn't have furniture to put in there. We didn't have any use for that room. And so I saw this as an opportunity. Uh, I remember that I had a friend when I, was, when I was in like the second grade who had a pool table in his house. And I always thought that that's when you know you've really made it, when you've got a pool table in your house. And so it's like something I've been wanting to happen since I was like eight or nine years old. And so I thought this was finally my chance. And I was really surprised that Gretchen went along with it. And she said, okay, we can get a pool table. And uh, I quickly found out that that's even a a more attainable goal than I realized. I found one on Facebook Marketplace. And even after I paid movers to, to go, you know, disassemble it and reassemble it in my house, it was still like a third of the cost of buying a brand new one. So here I am. I've I finally arrived. I've got my own pool table. And can you guess what happened after that? <laughs> right. So I played I played with it a lot when I first got it. You know, like that's all I did the first weekend that I had it. And then it got to where I'd play a couple of racks a day, uh, and then it got to where maybe I'd play a couple of racks a week, and then eventually it became just a, a place for folding laundry and and uh, and you know storing laundry that you should have put away but you did, and then you left it on the pool table. And the only time we ever really actually played pool on that table was if we had company over or something like that, and they wanted to play a few racks, we would do it. So. It was like, at first, it was the most awesome thing in the world to me, uh, but then within just a couple of months, it, you know, the novelty had worn off, and it wasn't really special to me anymore. That table was just, it was old news. It was just there. It was largely taken for granted, gr- for granted forgotten about, uh, only special on, you know, on occasion to me. Okay, so with that story saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were made clean. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. He prostrated himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus asked, Were not ten made clean, but the other nine, where are they? Was none of them found to return, excuse me, was none of them found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, 
Get up and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. Amen. So interestingly, uh, just a quick thing that I'll point out here. Uh, we're reminded, and it's been a while in Luke's gospel since we've been reminded of this, that at this point in the story, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. Now, I, I know we celebrated Easter um, uh, a couple of weeks ago, and so we jumped ahead in our sermon series and we covered some Easter-appropriate scriptures, but now we're back to kind of where we were in the, the natural progression of that sermon series. And so we're, we are reminded that Jesus is now on his way to Jerusalem, and of course we know what happens when Jesus gets to Jerusalem. Um, and we will find this out in the next couple of weeks in our sermon series that Jesus is drawing rather near to Jerusalem at this point as well. Well, along the way, he encounters this leper colony. Ten men with skin diseases call out to him to be healed. He tells them to go present themselves to the priests. And, of course, that was according to uh, laws that were laid out in the Old Testament book of Leviticus. It was the priest's duty to determine whether somebody was clear of a skin disease. The Judeans kind of believed the Samaritans to be kind of like traitors, and be they, they've betrayed the true faith of God, and they really, are, uh, they really don't get along well. In fact, I, I hate to, um, you know, with what's going on there right now, I mean, really, truly some, some uh, humanitarian atrocities are happening there right now, but I think it is fair to compare the way the Israelites and the Samaritans felt about each other to like the way the Israelis and the Palestinians feel about each other. Um, I mean, they really did not get along. So it's a big deal that Jesus is praising this Samaritan for his faith in this story. Um, that would have been kind of shocking, kind of scandalous to uh, uh, Judean readers of the time. And so what happens is the, the faith of this Samaritan, a foreigner, is compared to the faith of the children of Israel. Um, several times throughout Luke's gospel, we see that someone like a Samaritan, they demonstrate greater faith, more receptivity to the way that God is working in their lives than the children of Israel did. And then Jesus, of course, will occasionally chide the Israelites for, for this lack of faith. We find that uh, in this story that this Samaritan man is, is changed by this act of love and healing performed for him by God. This is a story about the, what we today would call the conversion of the Samaritan man. He comes to faith in Jesus because of this act. And, of course, he shows gratitude. He glorifies God. And then when we think about the, uh, the, other, the other men that did not return to glorify God. And it's like kind of, I don't know, we tend to, I, I've said this before many times in my preaching, when we, when we read stories like this, we tend to put ourselves into the story. And a lot of times when we read a story like this, we would think of ourselves like we're the Samaritan. We would have been the ones to go back and glorify and praise God. But I kind of think there's a chance we may have been more like the, the children of Israel who didn't return to glorify God. And so because of that, I think to myself, well, maybe, maybe they had a good reason. You know, a leper would have been somebody who was unable to participate in society. That's why they lived in these colonies, like kind of on the outskirts of the city, because they were, they were considered to be ritualistically unclean. They, they could not be. They were like... Uh, Beyond being just a pariah, they were, they were sort of, they lived on the fringes of society. They, maybe these people are, were cleansed and they were so excited to go see their families that they haven't been able to be around that they, they ran to go, you know, be with them or something like that. I, I tend to try not to judge them too harshly because there's a good chance that I might be that person in this story. And so I kind of feel like I have to um, give them a little bit of grace. But it also could be that perhaps since, since they would have considered themselves, I mean, well, you know, to, to be the, uh, the heirs of the covenant that God had made with Abraham, 
sort of the, the God's chosen people, the, those, these rightful heirs. It could have been that maybe they had just grown too comfortable in their, that status as God's chosen people. They had kind of viewed this type of work on their behalf as something they're simply entitled to. So this healing act of Jesus's just didn't have the same effect on them as it did on the Samaritan man, the outsider, who recognized the need to give thanks and praise God in that moment. So they, I think there is a lesson, of course, for the church today in that. You know, in last week's message, I felt like the scripture was really directed towards more mature believers, people who have been in the faith for a long time. And I think maybe that that's, the scripture today speaks really well to people like that. There might be a tendency to look at the, the Israelites in the story like this one and to be critical of their lack of faith. But Fred Craddock, uh, uh, Christian educator, he warns against such finger pointing. He writes, it's often the stranger in the church who sings heartily the hymns that we have long left to the choir, who expresses gratitude for blessings we had not noticed, who listens attentively to the sermon we think we have already heard, who gets excited about our old Bible, and who becomes actively involved in acts of service to which we send small donations. Must it always be so? This story can be taken as a, pre a precautionary tale, not to allow our faith to become like that pool table I had in my upstairs great room. It's a precautionary tale to not allow our faith to become something that's taken for granted. Don't let it become an unimportant part of our life, something we only really care about on occasion. Something we only look at from time to time and say, you know, I really ought to do more with that. Well, maybe one of these days. Shouldn't be the kind of thing that only comes to mind when we need something. So there are several ways that we can avoid our faith becoming like that. I, I certainly couldn't come up with an exhaustive list of the ways that we could do that. But I will offer a few suggestions today, a few uh, actual practical steps that we can take to help keep our faith, uh, you know, to safeguard us against our faith becoming like that. An old spiritual, spiritual discipline that I find can still be very meaningful today is that of, of listing your blessings, and I'm suggesting that practice, like in actuality, take out a pen and a piece of paper and write down a list of your blessings. And I think if you do this, you will find that there are a million things to be grateful for and a million reasons to praise God. Now, when we do this, I think we have to be careful not to only focus on material blessings, um, I mean, not to say that those things aren't blessings, but there are a lot of ways that we are blessed that are not in, in, in material things. N.T. Wright writes, We know, if we have any Christian faith at all, that our God is the giver of all things. Every mouthful of food we take, every breath of air we inhale, every note of music we hear, every smile on the face of a friend, a child, a spouse, all that and a million things more are good gifts from God's generosity. As I've noted even today, even though in, in contemporary Protestant Christianity it's typically only celebrated on one Sunday, right? Easter is really supposed to be a two-month-long celebration. And we believe in a world that's, that's filled with suffering and death, but in a God that cares and loves us enough to enter into that suffering alongside us and to do so bringing a message of hope, of healing, 
of reconciliation. That God is the resurrected Christ, the living Lord of all creation. That's a blessing to be thankful for in and of itself. So that should be at the top of the list. The fact that there's beauty in this world and not just ugliness all the time. That reminds me of these, these Easter truths. That's a blessing. So every time I, I am in nature, I love to go hiking. I got a chance to go do that about a month ago. Every time I view a piece of artwork, every time I hear a piece of music, read a piece of poetry, um, enjoy a piece of literature, those are, that, the beauty that exists in the world reminds me of God's goodness, and that's a blessing. Count your blessings as a reminder to be thankful and to praise God and as a safeguard against your faith becoming stale, becoming something you take for granted, something that's mostly forgotten. Another thing that I would suggest is kind of along those same lines, and it has to do with, with how you pray. Hopefully you're in the habit of daily prayer, and if you, if you aren't, th then that's okay. Everybody's at sort of different places in their faith journey. But if you aren't in the habit of daily prayer, you can, you can make that a habit. Pick a time throughout your day where even just for a few minutes, you can have a little bit of solitude. It's hard. I have a five-year-old. Um, you have to really be deliberate to make that happen. But it can and so uh, that would be maybe a thing I would suggest. If that's not a habit you're in currently, um, then make it a habit to be in daily prayer. And sometimes your daily prayer can just be sitting in silence, just kind of aware of God's presence. It doesn't have to be anything, um, you know, uh, anything beyond that. It's not like you have to have the perfect words to say or anything. Sometimes the best prayers that you can have are, are just listening prayers. But anyway, um, so, but if you are already in the habit of daily prayer, when you pray, make sure you aren't just asking God for stuff or bringing new things to God. Make sure that you are setting aside some time to just, uh, to, well, of course, to just be with God, but also to look back, to recall things that you have prayed for in the past and give thanks a prayer journal might be helpful for that. Even if you just jot down, you know, a few sentences or like a bulleted list or something like that. Writing down what you're praying for can be very helpful because you can go back through that list and you can see things that you have been praying about and you might realize that that issue has been resolved. That's no longer on my mind. That's not something I'm praying about anymore. And that can be a reminder to give thanks. It can help uh, remind you that when you, you, you pray, you can make petitions to God, but you should, al should also spend some time simply praising God. And then, of course, keeping that prayer journal can sometimes help you to realize that answers have been, uh, prayers have been answered, maybe in a way that you weren't expecting at the time, but now that you're looking back on it and remembering that season, you can see the way that God was, was active and working through that season. And this is a great way to help you to, to mature in your faith, to grow closer to God. We have a tendency in, in like Western culture, the way that God is a lot of times portrayed like in pop culture, um, we have a tendency to kind of try to make God little, little more than a divine fulfiller of wishes. Or uh, people pursue religion primarily for its therapeutic value. But once we can move past that and see that God is bigger than that, that marks an important milestone in our spiritual journey. And so I think that these couple of uh, practices I've suggested can help with that. And I'm sure that there are, are many more suggestions that, that I could make as to how we can avoid uh, our faith becoming stale, becoming like that pool table that I used to have that I only ever uh, you know, even looked at it on special occasions. Um, but I, I'll make just one more suggestion. I'm sure there, like I said, are many more I could make. But 
this one kind of also goes in hand, hand in hand with uh, some of what we've talked about quite a bit recently, kind of has to do with our prayer life a little bit as well. But, uh, you know, back in December, I think it was, we began talking about, uh, I wanted to offer suggestions on how we can grow in our faith, how we can avoid Sunday morning being really the only catalyst for spiritual growth in our life. And so something that I suggested was that we get into the habit of, of blessing people throughout the week. You know, to bless somebody from the Hebrew expression meaning to add strength to somebody's arm. So an encouraging phone call, uh, helping them, uh, helping somebody catch up on some household chores, helping out with a couple bags of groceries or a tank of gas if that's the need and if you have the means to do that. But that, that was what I was encouraging us to do, to uh, set our intentions. I will bless one person this week. And if you can bless one person throughout your week, why not? Three, if you can do that, why not one a day? That might not be, uh, that might be a little hard to do in some of the busyness of our contemporary world, but it's not a bad thought. And to be clear, I think that our church does a really good job with this. I can note many instances where I see members of our church blessing others, and I'm, I'm grateful for that. So I don't want to make this seem like I'm finger pointing or anything like that. I want to encourage us to continue to seek ways to bless one another. I want to encourage that. I want to celebrate it when I see it. So we started our list of suggestions with, with counting your blessings. If you count your blessings and you truly believe that your blessings aren't coming just from any old place, but from God, well, that... that is a great practice for helping us to, to keep our faith front and center to grow because we know that those blessings aren't coming from just any old place. They are coming from the God who was revealed to us in Jesus Christ. And if we count our blessings and we can see all the ways that we are blessed, then I really think the response to that, the, the proper response would be our heart welling up with this sense of God's love for us, and that would fill us with a desire to, to go and to bless others simply because we are filled with God's love, expecting no, no, nothing in return, no reward for those blessings besides knowing that, that we can live in the kingdom and the reign of God here and now. And the scripture we'll look at next week, uh, Jesus declares, the kingdom of God is within your grasp. And indeed it is. The promises that are laid out in the gospel are not far off. They are available to us here and now. And so, uh, you know, I've touched on this idea of blessing. Let me just expand on this final suggesting, suggestion I'm making on how we can grow our faith a little bit more. Um, you can avoid your faith becoming something that's largely forgotten, taken for granted, only thought of or felt as if it's needed on occasion by, by living your faith. Perform services to others. Participate in ministries of justice and compassion. Have you been blessed? Bless others in return. Pray. Keep your prayer journal. But prayer was never meant to be a substitute for action. People a lot of times will say this expression, and you might disagree with me on this, and that's okay, but people will say, uh, there's nothing we can do about it but pray. I find that to be rarely true. I find that there's almost always something that you can do. We pray the loudest when we pray not with our mouths, but with our hands and with our feet. The promises laid out in the gospel are available to us here and now. We can live in the kingdom of God here and now. But we aren't really doing that if we aren't acting like we, we live in the kingdom of God here and now. Amen. I want to I close us with prayer, but I want us to do this, this closing prayer together. And... For that, I'd like to, uh, to pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Now, me, even though I've probably prayed this prayer a thousand times, you put me on the spot, the, the words are just going to go out of my head, even though they're super familiar. So if you're like me, 
you can open your hymnal to page, or to, to I guess, hymn number 759. It's like right towards the back of the hymnal. And right on the middle of the page, it says the Lord's Prayer. And I, I, I would love if we could recite that together. So I'll give those who might need it a chance to, to turn over to number 759. Are we ready? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And I, I, I just think that, that, that in that prayer, of course, I could preach multiple sermons on this prayer alone, and I'm sure that I think I remember even somebody sharing with me that Pastor Jeff had at some point preached a series through the, this prayer. But I think about what, what we pray there, uh, you know, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And uh, we, we really pray that prayer most effectively when we pray it with our hands and our feet. So, Lord, I just would pray that you would empower us to, um, to be kingdom people, to be Easter people. Lord, we know that you don't leave us on our own to do these things. We don't make your kingdom come by our power alone, um, but it's by, it's by your hand that that can happen, by the grace that you give us each day, by the guidance and the correction uh, and the teaching of the Holy Spirit. And so we just pray um, that you would uh, oh, just open our hearts and our minds to the work that your spirit is doing in our lives and um, give us courage to, to walk our faith as well as talk it. In Jesus' name, amen. Brothers and sisters, it's been a joy to be gathered with all of you today. Um, just as a reminder, take a look at our, our new mission display, our ministry partners display in the back of the, uh, back of the lobby if you haven't had a chance to check that out. Um, yet there will be, um, you know, that would be a place that we'll be displaying information about our ministry partners. Um, and, and we'll be updating that periodically, so make sure you get in the habit of taking a look at that uh, once in a while. Uh, anyway, as I said again, it's been a pleasure to be with all of you this morning, brothers and sisters. And uh, as you go, go with the grace and peace of God until I see you again. God bless. Love you all. You're dismissed.